this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Yeah. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Great evening to you all. Um, this is the first night of the series uh, from whence we came. Um, the reason that I thought to keep this to, to start this program, it was actually from um, a statement that a young student made last year. He um, he stated that he um, and this is a, um, a black student, um, black young man. And he said it. He didn't feel that he had anything to be proud of, and that hurt me, shook me to my core. It made me realize that there is so much work to be done. Um, although there is history that I grew up learning, it doesn't mean I can't take for granted that everyone has this history. Um, and, and, and had the privilege to have parents to, to pass certain history down. Um, speaking of which, um, it, traditionally in the African-American culture, we would sit around the dinner table and talk about our day, talk about history, traditions, our culture. Um, and now I'm not sure if it's, if it's the same way with you, but many times we don't necessarily sit down and just eat. Right when we eat, we're looking at TV, we're on our phones, devices, all of that, and so that connection is not happening as much as it did before. And what's happening is that history is being lost. Um, and a lot of times, with our with the African American culture, our history is passed on orally, you know, from generation to generation. And um, this is a, it's such a rich history we can't afford. To, to have it lost. And there's a lot of lessons um, in there that we can learn from. Um, as I say, if we don't learn from the past, then we're bound to repeat it. And some of the history that we're going to talk about today, we do not want repeated. Um, so um, that's one of the reasons why we have this format of, uh, we have Miss Green in the kitchen and she's going to share a, a dish with us and then she's going to talk about her, um, her experience um, in the Jim Crow era and going through uh, having used the, the Green Book for Negro Travelers. Has anyone ever heard of the Green Book for Negro Travelers before? Okay. Um, there is um, a, a, a series, uh, it was last year that the Lovecraft Country came out on HBO that talked about um, that, that referenced the Green Book for Negro Travelers. And um, there was also a movie. Let, let me see if I can say his name correctly. Mahashala Ali, right? Got it. And um, there was also a documentary on CBS that I was looking at um, last night. Um, but um, I digress. Let's get to you, Miss Betty. So Miss Betty joins us as the... Um, as an entrepreneur, as a motivator, as an educational speaker, as a, um, a mom, a grandmom, and um, she is also. Do you, would you, I need to show this picture of you, Miss Betty? I have okay. to because you're stunning in your Sunday best. That's another, again, another tradition of the African American culture. Um, we would um, when we go out we look like we are going out um, to, to church. So I'm just trying to see, where is that? Okay, right now it's not popping up. I will make sure to, sit, to show that picture though, because I, I, um, you were looking so sharp in your Sunday best and your beautiful uh, church hat. Thank you. Um, but Thank I don't you. want to take away from the, from the event. Um, 
Ms. Green, can you also tell us about the the um, the organization that you are a part of? All right, we're going to start with that and then you'll see how it all comes together. Okay. Currently, I'm the president of the Mid-Island Club of the National Association, Negro Business and Professional Women's Clubs Incorporated. We have been a uh, club on, in Suffolk County for the past 63 years. And one of our greatest achievements is that every year when we're in the process now, uh, we send letters to every public high school on Long Island from Amityville all the way out to South Hold. Uh, we make contact with the guidance counselors to let them know that Mid Island Club is giving a scholarship. Uh, back in the day when we were able to go out in public and raise money, we've given uh, $2,500, $3,000 scholarships. But because of COVID this year, we were only able to give three $1,000 scholarships. We also have a youth uh, club in which we teach the young people uh, resume writing, how to present yourself in public because as an educator, I've learned that many children think that because uh, every environment is not the same, let me say that. And sometimes children don't know how to present themselves professionally in an environment. And many times that can uh, work in their, um, doesn't work in their favor. So we have a youth uh, club. I was a um, youth director for four years and um, Mid-Island Club is close to my heart. So it was formed in 1935. And as you hear my talk, you will understand why it needed to be formed because, um, and I guess I might as well go into it. Back in the day, there was something that was called Jim Crow. Let me, let, let me bring you up. In 1865, the slaves, the slaves were free. Now, because slavery was an economic system, uh, the, the landowners lost free labor. Okay, so what they had to do was begin to find a way to get that free labor back. That's where you got your uh, police departments and prison camps, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. During the, uh, I would say from about 1875, once reconstruction was over with, probably up until, I have a story, I have two stories, up until 1980, it's not as prevalent, but Jim Crow laws were intact. Uh, even in my hometown in Brentwood, um, if you went on Washington Avenue, which was the north side, um, and you were caught over there by yourself and you were African-American, you could wind up in trouble. But the Jim Crow laws, the purpose of the Jim Crow laws were to keep African-Americans at a certain level. Okay, that's just the reality of this history, good, bad, or indifferent. The purpose of the Green Book was so that once uh, we became a mobile society and people wanted to go here, there, and everywhere, you had Jim Crow laws that if you were caught in town at a certain time, that could be, your, that could be the end of you. We have a family story that my grandfather, who never drove, helped to uh, get a, uh, they would have called him a Negro man, but helped to get a Negro man out of town. We lived in Montgomery, Alabama, uh, which was the heart of the South. And um, he helped, he and his friends, his, uh, these two men got into an uh, argument and the black man killed the white man. So he knew it was death. So what they did was they found a man with a pickup truck and the same way they did during um, slavery with the Underground Railroad, they buried the man, wrapped him up in a blanket, sat on top of him until they were able to get him to a safe place out of town, all right? Because had, you know, had they caught them, um, he would have died. The Green Book, like I said, came along when um, African Americans began to purchase cars and drive, and nobody wants to sit in the house Take it, take it like COVID. How many of you are ready to go on a vacation? Raise your hands. Okay, you about ready to get out of your house. You wanna see a different scenery. But unlike COVID, you had laws. You had something called the Mason-Dixon line. And I remember this as a child. Once you pass uh, Washington DC, it could become detrimental to you. So, Many times, African-Americans, and, and some of you can attest to this, if you were going on a trip, especially down south, 
Your parents had you up by three o'clock, four o'clock in the morning, okay? Uh, had their little food with them, all right? And you got in the car and you had enough sense not to ask, are we there yet? Because it was just a blessing to be able to get in the car. What I'm going to do, and I started it, there were some, I'm going to do, um, at the end, I'm going to do a shoebox meal. But I kept this pan right here uh, because one of the staples in the African-American community is sweet potato pie. Okay, now if you go to any event, somebody has made or you want a piece of sweet potato pie. And what I am learning is that instead of boiling your potatoes, tips for all you ladies who want to make sweet potato pie or gentlemen, instead of boiling your potatoes, what I need you to do is bake them for about an hour and 20 minutes and then they will soften and all of the sweet. And this is what you're seeing right here. This is the sugar that comes out of the potato. All right, so uh, that's what you want to do. Growing up from, uh, I'm not ashamed of my age, I'm 70. So um, I was born in 1950, the middle of the, I get, this is the 20th century. We're in the 21st century. All right, so I was born in the middle of the 20th century. My grandmother's great-grandmother was a slave. My grandfather, whose father owned a large farm in Lowndes County, uh, Alabama, he could read and write because they wanted to keep the land and land is always very important. My grandfather didn't go to school. So in order for him to sign his checks, et cetera, my mom and her children had to teach him how to write his name. Now in my family, education was important. And when I lived in Montgomery, Alabama with my grandparents, there was no such thing as I don't wanna go to school. No, 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 you'd have a say. You gonna get up and you were going, okay? And you had a respect for the teachers because being a teacher, especially in the African-American community, meant that you had graduated from high school and you had gone on to college. Now they don't do this anymore, but back in the day in our communities, when it was segregated, and I grew up in a segregated community also, and segregation had a good part and it had its poor parts. But when I graduated, or uh, when back in the day when you graduated from high school, it was such a big deal that the community, now think about this, if this happened in 2021, how it could change our communities. Back in the day, when someone would graduate from high school, hey, Norman, what would happen is uh, that, um, the whole community would come out and for you to put your cap and gown on, it meant that you had made an achievement that many of the older folks did not do because they could not go to school. Understand that many of them, once you got past, um, when you got into the 21st century, the first part of it, the 20th, the first part was good. But you had the depression. In 1928, the economy in America collapsed. Now, if it was hard for the dominant society, what do you think it was like for those people who did not have access to a lot of things? And this is poor whites as well as poor blacks. Okay? So my mom grew up in a she, she was a child of the depression. So my mother threw away nothing. All right, there was a use for everything. And this afternoon I found myself, I could not find a, uh, a piece of paper. So me being my mother's child, I took a cardboard, tore it up and flipped it on the other side and you could write, okay, um, on, on the cardboard. But back to why there was a need for the green book because African-Americans were not allowed, let's be very clear. There was just some places they were not allowed to go into. I remember we would travel at night. 
we would have to have our little shoe box. Okay, I remember stopping at a gas station and what they had, and it said white, and then it said colored. Okay, while I'm thinking about this, we have gone from colored to Negro, to African-American, to black, depending upon which generation you lived in, okay? And I remember as a child going to um, a bathroom and my mother wouldn't let me go in because it was so nasty because they would not clean the bathrooms that Negroes were allowed to go into. I remember as a child in Alabama with my grandmother, we had to go to the back of the bus. I go to nobody's back of the bus. If I'm on a bus, thank God I got a car, but if I'm on a bus, trust and know, I'm in either seat one, two, or three, because I do not do the back of the bus because it, it's, it was traumatizing. It was traumatizing to have to, to drink out of a, um, a nasty, at times, water spigot, a water fountain, okay? So Jim Crow laws, and this is what I want to talk about, which was from 1885, and some places I would say even up until now, prevented on purpose. Please understand, this was not, oh, we're, no, 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 you did this on purpose to prevent African-Americans from moving forward. And it didn't matter what you had accomplished. If they said you couldn't do it, they said you couldn't do it. I'm going to put in a personal story. I think my youngest, my only had, I was pregnant with my second child. This was 1975. We're going on Easter break down to North Carolina. I had to be about six or seven months. So you could tell that I was pregnant. My ex-husband and my little boy, we stopped into a restaurant and we didn't know that they only served white. This is 1975, 1975. And we walked in and there was a nice lady who was, uh, I guess, the, what do you call it? And she said very nicely, she said, well, perhaps y'all wanna go someplace else. And we left and we did. And as I was, I'm pregnant now, as I was turning around, this man put his foot out trying to trip me because had he tripped me, he knew that my husband would have reacted to him. 1983 in America, uh, Gatlinburg, Tennessee, or we were going, we were, we had said we we're going to take the children to the World's Fair. So we drove down to Tennessee. We went to North Carolina, went up into the beautiful mountains, found our way to Tennessee, Knoxville. And like I said, they were up in the mountains and we stopped for gas. Now understand we were driving a big Cadillac car, okay? My ex-husband always gave me an extra set of keys when we went on trips. So just in case something happened, I we could get away, okay? We went in, paid the gas, because back in the day they would come out and they would uh, unlock you. Well, we didn't have a gas cast, but you would give the person the keys. My ex-husband walked in and said, you didn't give me my keys back. He said, boy, now understand, this man was almost 40 years old. He said, boy, I gave you the keys. My son was in there, my two boys and my daughter was small. And I said, come on, Mo, because I, I had keys in my pocket, but come on, Mo. We walked across the street, I don't know, I don't know if it was Kentucky Fried or someplace else. Again, they didn't want to serve us my son noticed it. And looked up at his dad and said, Daddy, 
Why won't they serve us? That's Jim Crow laws. So what did we do? We got in our car. We got out of there because it was okay. Norman, Norman understands. Norman and my ex-husband are best friends. Okay. Norman and Judy and I, and we have been friends for over 40 years. Okay. So we got in and we left. 2000 East Islip, Long Island, New York. My person who does my nails is out. A friend of mine who happens to be Caucasian said, go down to my lady. So I take mm -hmm. my little cute self down to East Islip. I walk in and she gives me the strange look. Okay, we got a problem here, but my nails need to get done. I was the only African-American in there and I could tell that she didn't want me in there. Not a problem, finish my nails, I didn't give you a tip and I left. <laughs> okay, Jim Crow laws, Jim Crow laws. Why did we need the, uh, the green book? So that when you were traveling and you wanted to take your children to a nice place and every family, no matter what your race, creed or color is, deserves to be able to take their children to a nice place when they're little because you're making memories, okay? So, um, they started the Green Book. And what I'm gonna do right now is, I'm going to show you how they uh, made a box lunch. Now they didn't have Kate Spade back in the day, but, <laughs> <laughs> but we're going to make a box lunch. And if my assistant will help me, okay. The first thing you did was, you took out all of the wrapping in the box. Okay, now remember these were, back in the day, these were heavy duty cardboard boxes. And if you spill something in there, it would hold, all right? Now, most shoebox lunches consisted of, because you, you had to remember, you couldn't stop at the restaurant. Stopping at the restaurant could get you killed, depending upon where you stopped at. So, being the bright, intelligent, I don't want to die people that they are, they would have, hold on, please. Okay, let me wash my hands because I know somebody gonna say she ain't washed our hands because I know how people are. Whoop. Okay, thank you. So what you would do is uh, you would have some, fried some chicken because chicken will last. You can eat chicken hot or cold. If you think about it, you can. So you would get yourself some chicken, okay? And you would, depending upon the piece you like, I ate so many thighs and legs when I was a child, I don't eat them now, but you would wrap about two pieces of chicken per person. All right, I'm doing the chicken legs and you would wrap it in aluminum foil, okay? And then, you get yourself some bread and they were still making bread in the plastic, whatever. So you put your bread in here. All right. So just in case, then you would get, here's a soda I had. Okay. Back in the day, they would have Coca-Cola. Okay. Coca-Cola soda. And it was about this size. Okay. So you put your little Coca-Cola in here and it would probably get warm, but that would be all right. You get yourself some cookies. They didn't have cookies like this, or you would do what I'm doing now. I'm making a homemade sweet, sweet potato pie. You'd have your pie ready. You cut yourself some slices, put your sweet potato pie, some kind of sweet in there. And then you would put a piece of fruit in there. And that would hold you until you got to where you need it to be. Oh, forgot.
And of course, you always had the handy boiled eggs because boiled eggs are protein and protein will keep you filled. All right, so you had one or two boiled eggs. Now, if you were smart, you'd get yourself some hot sauce, put it in separately, because you want hot sauce for your chicken, all right? And then also with the hot sauce, it'll help if you make sure that if your bread is a little stale, put the hot sauce on it, put the two pieces of chicken together, somebody's getting happy. Uh, put the hot sauce on it, uh, put the two pieces of chicken together, and then you would have a meal and you would put it in the shoe box just like this. And everybody would have their little shoe box meal and they would be ready as the old folk would say, ready to go. Okay. So that would, you would, you wouldn't have to stop in anybody's restaurant or anything else. You would have a place to go. What I have learned recently is that because of Jim Crow, if you're on Long Island, there's this place called Sag Harbor. The rich and famous want to be there now. But Sag Harbor, Azure, was founded by African Americans who were not able to participate, go to the beach, because Robert Moses, who made Jones Beach, they didn't want Black folk at Jones Beach. That's real. They did, they did not want you there. Okay. So back in the day, it's just like the Levittown homes. They didn't want you there. Uh, so African-Americans found a way to live life within their society to survive. But I don't want you to think that it's all, it was all so bad. Segregation had its good part. This little green book had its good part. And it didn't have its good part. When our community, and you don't want to go back to that, but when our communities were segregated, we had to depend upon each other. Okay? We had to, because you were not allowed in the dominant society. So you had to depend upon each other. So somebody had a grocery store, somebody had a hairdresser, somebody had a barbershop, you had your local church. All right. And they found a way. They found a way to survive in spite of. I dedicate this talk tonight to the Negro teachers that I had in Montgomery, Alabama. And I remember we didn't have buses. We had to walk. My brother who recently passed, I was very clumsy as a child. And my grandmother would pair us up, brothers and sisters. So I'm stumbling and bumbling all over the place. And there was a drunk named Fates Carwell. So my brother's nickname for me was Fates Carwell. Every time I, I fell, oh, come on, get up, Fates Carwell. All right. But we went to school. Educators were respected. Okay. You were expected to learn. And God help you if you ever had the opportunity to start talking back to a teacher. That was a death sentence. You gonna curse a teacher? Are you crazy? I'm gonna give you another little personal story. My cousin and I, we were in first or second grade or maybe kindergarten, first grade. And my cousin has always had a smart mouth and I don't know what happened to her brain that day but she decided to get fresh with the teachers. Now this was back in the day. Remember, I lived in a segregated community. So teachers came to your house. You can't do that now, but teachers came to your home and there was a, a, a relationship with the teacher and the parents and the church and the community. You were expected to learn. Don't act like you ain't got no sense. Okay? My cousin was acting up. She decided to curse at the teacher. I don't know if you've been in homes down south or, well, we had, they would call it a shotgun house. And under the shotgun house, it was like four big legs. You might've had five or six rooms. It went from the front to the back. Okay? And we were under there playing something. And I saw the teacher and I said, ooh, this is not gonna be good. I knew that as a kid. 
So she says to my grandfather, evening, Mr. Jones, which meant good evening. Uh, I need to talk to you about your granddaughter, Beverly. And she said, and he stood up because back in the day, men stood up when ladies walked up. Okay. And um, he asked her what happened. And she said, well, your granddaughter uh, asked me to kiss her backside. My grandfather said, she did what? I will never forget this. She did what? Well, the next day, needless to say, the next day when my cousin Beverly went to school, she was a wonderful student. And from the time she left, uh, until, from the time she stayed in uh, Alabama until the time she left, she was a wonderful student because there was a, in the segregated community, there was a, a respect and there was an expectation. Okay. I'm not saying the teachers don't have it now, but there was an expectation that you would learn. Many communities were built because of the green book. Because if you have people driving and they need a place to stay, what does that equal to? That equals to business. That equals to hotel rooms. That equals to meals. That equals to uh, somebody cleaning the room up. So in the midst of the green book, there were some prosperous, segregated um, societies where, now remember, you had entertainers who could not go to white uh, establishments. You had um, Cal Basie, um, you had all of these other people, they couldn't go. You had Ella Fitzgerald, you had Brooke Benton, it didn't, until about 1975, most African-American entertainers were part of the Chitlin Circus and they could not, they could sing, they could entertain you, but they could not sleep or be taken care of at a white establishment. That was just the law, all right? Mary Wilson, who died the other day as part of the Supremes, the Supremes were part the Supremes, the Temptations, the, um, um, the what you call it for, uh, I forgot their names, the Four Tops, all of them were part of the Chitlin Circus. What was the Chitlin Circuit? That was where you could only go to black um, environments to entertain. Because in some, bless Dick, Hart's, um, uh, Dick Clark's heart, back in the day, you didn't see Black people and white people, teenagers dancing together. That's why Soul Train was so important because Soul Train was our uh, American bandstand, all right? Where our young people could get on and dance and do all sorts of things, okay? So this is the part that bothers me. With the success of the Green Book, highways had to be built. Guess where most major highways are built through? African American communities. That's fact. You can look it up. That's a fact. Okay? What happened is when they, in the early 60s, when they wanted to uh, supposedly make highways in America, they went through every African-American community that was prosperous and built, tore it down and built the highway through it. That is part of Jim Crow. And I never defined Jim Crow for you. So let me back up. Jim Crow are those laws that are governed by a country, a state, a city that puts some people ahead of others. That's real. So when you were in a Jim Crow environment, I'm sure many of you have heard this. When you went for a job, your, your, the older people or whatever said, you're gonna have to be 10 times better than that person in order for you to get the job. You can't do what somebody else does and keep your job because those were the laws that gave other people more advantage than other people. 
the Green Book in Detroit, wonderful community. Sag Harbor, Long Island, even up in Canada, in the South, Detroit, Michigan, Tulsa, Oklahoma, out in California. There were conclaves where only African-Americans went, African-Americans enjoyed themselves, African-Americans had their own land, but it was because of the Green Book, because your reality is that you did not want to travel by yourself at night alone in America, because it could mean that you would die. I am grateful that we are at a time now, I wanna share this with you. When um, my ex-husband and I took our children to Disney World in Florida for the first time. And those who know me know that I'm a worship and appraiser. So when we got on the land, I raised my hands and I said, thank you, Lord. And one of my sons said, Ma, please. But what he did not understand was that we could pay for a ticket, we could take you to Disney World and nobody was gonna say one word to you. And that was progress because your father and I would not have been able to do that. Number one, we didn't come from that environment where we could afford it. But number two, we would not have been allowed there. So for me to be able to take, uh, me and my ex-husband to be able to take the children here, there and everywhere, to expose them and every parent who's a good, who every parent wants to expose their child to something different and better than what they had. That's the American dream. That's why people fight to come here so that they get an equal chance to live and have a nice home and drive a decent car and have health care and just live a decent life. Was it hard growing up? I will never forget April 4th, 1968. It was the day that Dr. King was killed, assassinated. And that day lives in my head and heart forever. Because he was, he was, the king for all people, not just African-Americans, but for everybody. And he was killed, and I don't wanna go into it because of a view that he had. But I remember the next day in school, and I was talking to my son uh, last night and his girlfriend, and I said, well, it was me who led the march outside of Brentwood High School, cause something was gonna happen. At the end of the day, we had the Human Relations Club. I am grateful that I lived in such a time that I could see the changes in America. I am grateful that when my children got ready to go to college, they didn't have to jump through all the hoops that I had to jump through or my ex-husband had to grow, jump through. I am grateful for the older people who came before me and said, honey, you need to do this and honey, you need to do that and honey, you need to do the other. I am proud of my culture. Like I said, I thank God for the Negro teachers in Montgomery, Alabama, and we went to a poor school, but they poured in me the importance of knowing who your history is. And the reason why they did that is because they knew what we would have to face in the world as Negroes. So every morning, when we got to school, we said the Pledge of Allegiance to this country. We said a prayer to our God. And every day we learned something about, ne they called it Negro history. We learned something about Negro history. So when I came back to school in New York, I knew who I was. I knew about Harriet Tubman. I knew about Sojourner Truth. I knew about Phyllis Wheatley. Uh, I knew about Ellen Craft, who was part of the uh, uh, abolitionist movement. I knew when you know who you ooh, when you know who you are, 
no matter what anybody else says. It's kind of hard for somebody to tell you, well, you're not this, that, and the third. Mm -mm, boo. I know who I am. I know. I know from whence the rich history that I come from. And that has been my stay because we're all going to deal with stuff in life. It ain't necessarily racist, but we're going to deal with it. I grew up in the uh, uh, women's back in the day. A woman couldn't have a credit. Now, I know this sounds crazy to y'all, but back in the day, a woman couldn't have a credit card without her husband signing for it. That's real. A woman couldn't own property. And right now they're still fighting for a woman to have uh, say so over her body. But I'm grateful for how I grew up and where I grew up and when I grew up. I'm grateful for uh, the older people who poured into me. I'm grateful that at this season of my life, I can pour into young people to say, you can do this of all types of all kinds. One of my lasting legacies at Brentwood High School when I was a administrator is that we have a gang problem. And I would go, I knew who the kids were. One afternoon a young man came in and he wanted to act stupid. And another young man looked at me and said, don't mess with her. I don't wanna deal with her this afternoon. And they walked out and I said, thank you God. Okay, but one of my legacies is that I deal with all people. Everybody has a right. Everybody. Your, the skin color, your skin color should not make a difference in how people treat you. Uh-uh. If you're gonna dislike me, dislike me for something else. Don't dislike me because you don't like the color of my skin. And you should never do that because everybody deserves a fair chance. Back to the green book, I'm grateful that I lived during that time. I'm grateful that I know what it is to live in a segregated community where the expectation is you will do this, that, and the third. I'm grateful for the people who poured into my life. My mom wasn't educated. I am the first woman in my family to get a college degree. That changed the whole traje trajectory for a lot of women in my family. So I'm grateful. I'm grateful I'm at this season of my life where I can pour into, okay? So thank you so very much. Oh, one last thing. Sweet potato pie. Now, I put in all of the ingredients. What I'm going to do is I put it's sweet potatoes that you bake, you put some cinnamon, you put some nutmeg, you put some uh, uh, vanilla flavoring, lemon flavoring, uh, put some sugar to your taste, okay? And then I'm gonna put some milk. I put two eggs, I'm gonna beat it, and then I'm gonna bake it. Okay, I got four this size sweet potatoes. You don't want the little skinny ones. I baked them for about an hour and 20 minutes until uh, the, the, the sugar began to come out of it. Then you know it's done. I peeled them when it was hot. Uh, Dion, I'm gonna make sure that Malika gets the recipe. <laughs> okay. And I get the pie. <laughs> okay. Because <laughs> I boil mine. So but thank you know you. what? I learned that when you boil them, you're boiling the sugar out. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, so you beat it, you bake it. Uh, you, oh, I put uh, a whole stick of butter in. This is not for somebody who's on a diet now. Understand that if you if you doing a diet and don't eat this, because I guarantee you that it's gonna have calories in it. And then I'm going to finish it up, bake it, and because Malika asked me, she'll be gifted with the pie. Okay, vanilla acts right. Like I said, I do it by eye, but I'll figure this out. Because, yeah, I've been making them so long, I kind of do them by eye, but I will figure it out. Thank you so much for allowing me to share with you. Um, our history is important and everybody should know theirs and everybody should be proud of theirs mm. because all of our histories help to make America what she is. Amen to that. So thank you so much. Um, like I said, if you ever go on a trip, and you don't want to stop, make yourself a little box. You can survive. Thank Betty. you so much. 
Betty, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Can I ask you a question? Yes, please ask questions. Okay, when when will this pie be made? <laughs> being that, being that, you, that you are my neighbor, Malika is in trouble because I want to come by your house and pick up the pie myself. So, Norman, uh, I will make you and Judy a pie this weekend. All right, okay. Okay, <laughs> and tell my friend I said hello. But I, I'll have a pie for you by Sunday. Okay. Now, also, everyone, I have to let you know that when I was a kid growing up, Betty was my babysitter. She used to babysit me when I when, when I was a little boy, and, uh, and and she kept me on the right track. I just want to let everyone know. I, I and to this day, I still look up to you. I love you too, Norman. <laughs> <laughs> Good seeing you. Good seeing you also, and understand, yes. uh, you become elders. So Norman and I and Judy, we're the elders of the community now. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yeah, we're the elders. Never thought we would be, but we're here. Mm -hmm. So thank you all so much. And thank you for tuning in. And I do hope that I uh, inspired you and uh, uh, said something that you can, you can deal with or will make your life a little bit better. Uh, and that we all should love you one another. All right? Uh, mm -hmm. There's no race of people is any better than another. Mm. My mother once taught me, and I didn't understand until I got uh, older. She said, you may have more money than me. You may live in a better house or a neighborhood than me, but you are no better than me because mm -hmm. you're only human. Miss mm. 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 Betty, you, you were such, such a, a pleasure to listen to the way you're able to integrate history and your own personal experience in a way that it's just like, I just felt like I was just a, a witnessing uh, a, an awesome show. Thank you. You know, um, I, I appreciate you and, and thank you for your candor. Um, at this point, I wanted to ask, um, I'm, I'd like to open it up to, to a questions for anyone that might have a question or, or would like to even give you some feedback before I ask a question. Okay. Um, is there anyone that wants to uh, give any feedback or, or ask a question? Um, I'd like to just say something. When we took those trips down south, there were two things. First, I always thought my parents took us early in the morning so we'd be asleep and wouldn't bother them on the trip. I didn't realize it was because of that. And secondly, you know, what stuck in my mind is we're driving to Florence, South Carolina, and I wake up and I look over to... And on the median of the highway, I see a chain gang. Mm -hmm. That blew my mind. And then when I got to my aunt's house, because uh, you all, some of you may know about the country. My I told my mother I had to go to the bathroom. And she took me two places. One was in a room with that pot with the lid. And I decided, well, I'm not going to that one. Then she took me outside in the dark. Oh. Mm and lifted me up over like a hole i couldn't i couldn't even go but well, that, that was awful you have to understand many times in poverty they did not have bathrooms i remember living with my grandma and i remember when they, they finally got a bathroom on the inside so what you did you you had to do now remember snakes lived in there too so you would hope <laughs> that a snake would not come yeah that a snake would not come out and my mother-in-law, until uh, she knew better, she would take a slop jar with her when she went on vacation, all right, because she had a daughter and they wasn't stopping until they got to where they needed to be. Mm. You know, I was list looking at the uh, documentary about the Green Book. For everyone, please, it is so much history packed in this documentary about the Green Book. You can catch it on um, CBS, the, um, the streaming CBS. Um, but they talked about the sundown towns. And um, with the sundown towns is they even have, they even had signs that you better make it out before the sun goes down or you might not make it out at all. Um, and the green book tried to lead you through to avoid those sundown towns. And um, the, the documentary said in Missouri alone, just the state of Missouri alone, they had 200 sundown towns. Um, and, it, and, and understand this, it was, a uh, it was a thing of survival. Um, the, in the documentary, they said that there was 4,000 lynchings 
between 1882 and 1968. And that's just the lynchings that were reported. Thank you. Remember that there were lynchings that people did just to, for entertainment. There were lynchings that they put on postcards. Mm -hmm. um, so this was the, the harsh reality that in the harsh history that this country has gone through. And the reason why I think it's so important to talk about it, to learn, is so that we remember the mistakes that were made so that we do not, do not we do not make it again, that we do not take our liberties for, for, uh, for granted. And we stand up when we feel like there's just something wrong, even if it's not about you. Justice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Right. You know, I'm gonna step back because I can go on forever. Um, with Hi, can I? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, please. Hi. Uh, yes, I'm. I'm listening in, and first of all, thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. Um, I uh, was. I'm 60 years old, so I was born in 1960. And I'm from the South and I remember those long trips. <laughs> and I also wanted, I remember those, those long trips and, and getting up at uh, three o'clock in the morning to go from Cleveland to Alabama. Mm -hmm. And I remember going through West Virginia and they, um, the, the highway wasn't that wide then. You had to go through the mountains right. and, um, and getting your gas there was times where we couldn't stop to get gas, although the tank was slow. And I remember one time when my dad stopped to get some food, I saw him at the window and then he had to go to the side to get the food. Mm. And he brought back and he, sometimes he would come back with the food, but he also come back with a little attitude. And I didn't understand what the attitude was for at the time, because I was so young, but I, I quickly grew to understand what the attitude was for us because we weren't welcome in some of the stores. I think there were Shoney's, uh -huh. Big Boys, and Howard Johnson's we could stay yes. at, but there was a lot of hotels we couldn't stay at. And um, there are homes throughout the South and they had lawn jockeys. Lawn jockeys was, blackface and basically they held a lantern and they would be at the at the front of the driveway there are two types one with the barber pole and one without a barber pole and i remember and i don't remember which one was which but one of them meant that this is a friendly house where blacks could stay the others meant you better not you know that this is a white home and you cannot stay there and it's it's, it's a racist it was racist, very racist. Oh. And I just wanted to share that with you. And also I wanted to share that um, back in the day, black people couldn't go in the store and try on clothes. Oh God, no. You had to either buy it. Thank you couldn't you. try on clothes, but you just had to buy it and you could not return it. Okay. Because you can't try on clothes and then a white person try on clothes behind That's you. That's right. That was just not allowed. And I remember the colored signs, the colored waiting rooms and the, the colored bathrooms and the white only signs. And it is traumatizing. And it's, and it's, and it's um, awful to know that racism is still alive and well. Um, I remember going to school in the seventies. Um, and I remember the, um, when the schools were, were integrated and I remember the fights between the blacks and the whites in my high school. And those fights back then, they were fighting with chains and bricks. Mm -hmm. It was um, not just with fists. And I do remember, you know, the respect that we showed our teachers and community leaders. And you definitely could not talk back to an adult. And that's one thing that I wish that would have continued um, because uh, the disrespect that a lot of people, young and old, are doing now is just uncalled for. And I think that um, we need to get back to some of the earlier um, values that we had. 
Yes. In regards to respecting our women, respecting our families, respect. And I just wanted to add that. And thank you so much, Malika, for putting on from which from which we came on uh, this whole series. And I thank everyone on this call. Thank you. Uh, thank you. My, my grandma was 1962. My uncle had 63. My uncle had passed. We had to go up to these steps because you had back in the South, there was you were a flower girl. So we had to get these flower girl dresses. And I'll never forget this. We had to wait until the white lady was finished. And then this young girl who was far younger than my grandma would say, gal, how can I help you? I was 11 or 12. And I said to myself, my grandma ain't no gal. But you couldn't go into the front door. You had to climb up the steps. And like the young man said, if you, if you, if you, whether you liked it or not, you had to, uh, uh, when you bought it, it was yours. Okay. You know, one of the things that I'm, I'm reading the comments and um, people saying thank you and they're saying it's traumatic experiences. And one of the things that I would like people to understand is that there is pride. There is just definite reason for pride in the, uh, in the African-American community because we are the survivors. We survived those traumatic experiences. You know, uh, we, we didn't get up, we persevered, we push on, we move on. But one of the reasons why it's so important to know the history is to know that we had to go through so much. So you do not take anything for granted. Right, you know? excuse, me. Um, oh, excuse me, sorry. Yes, please, Chip. I don't have my uh, a raised hand or anything, so excuse me again for interrupting. But please, I, Chip, go on. But, but I also wanted to mention that when you talked about the slop jar, <laughs> that took me way, 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 way back because the there was a pitcher for water and then there was a bowl mm -hmm. and it was in every room and it's and, and you go in there and you have the pitcher of water and you had the bowl and that's where you washed up, you know, and and everything, you know, because uh, back in the day. Every home did not have a bathroom, especially down south, and the roofs were tin. So that's one thing I love about the south is that they had the tin roofs, and when the rain hit the oh, roofs, yeah. it, it, the sound of it is so common and it's so wonderful. Um, and uh, the smell of the red dirt, but you had to go out into the owl house, and the owl house would be like in back of your house is this little oh, yeah. wood structure. And, it's, and basically like a little porta potty, but without, but it's always there and you had to dig the hole. So um, everything can go in there, but yeah, you had to watch out for snakes and any, the, any other critters. Yeah. <laughs> but Thank that slop job just took me way back and uh, I just had to comment on that. Thank you. Thank you, Chip. Um, Sharon, I see your hand is raised. Um, before we get to you, um, Sharon, I'd also like to encourage people to um, put uh, to to fill out the survey that Christy put in the the chat. If you can put that up again, Christy, and if you fill out a survey, you'll get this uh, mask hashtag Good Trouble. Oh. Um, giving respect to our civil rights icon John Lewis. Um, thank you. She put it. She put the survey back up in the chat again. Sharon, do you have a question? Actually, I was going to applaud, so I was using the wrong hand, but but I do want that. As long as I ask a question, I do want that. You know I'm a foodie, and uh, I do want that recipe, Malik, or you got to bring it to the office and share the pie with all of us. So uh, I, I uh, a very, very inspiring presentation, a very poignant presentation, and uh, thank you so much for sharing your stories with us. Thank you. I'm very, very touched. Yeah. Now I got to figure out how to put my hand down. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Thank you, Sharon. Moses, did you have a, a question or a comment? We can't hear you. Hi, Malika. That's a family recipe. I'm asking my mother not to be giving it out to everyone. So you, <laughs> so you must be special, Malika and Sharon and Norman, if she's just giving a family recipe. I just want to say that I'm proud. I am... Uh, I am proud of the history that I come from. 
And um, some of those stories that my mother gave are some of the stories that I, you know, I remember Gatlinburg, that's why I put it in the comments. And uh, Malika, thank you for doing that so our young people understand the resilience from which we come. So thank you. Amen, thank you. Thank you for being here. Were there any other questions or comments? Jordan, I think you wanted to say something. I do. Um, I don't mean to like be, I don't wanna say I'm being selfish. I'm coming from my heart right now. Um, I wanted to say that that actually really inspired me despite the way I grew up. It was com complete. I don't want to make you feel bad, but the, I grew up the complete opposite. I, you know, got lucky. I was able to go to school. I was able to have a future, but I still am moved by your um, speech anyway, regardless. Mm -hmm. I still have empathy for you. I still feel every word you said, and I really want to try to contribute, contribute to this, um, yeah organization more and help people like you and people like Malika just um, thrive and survive. And I want everyone to peacefully coexist because that's what I believe in. Regardless of the way I was, I grew up or the way anyone grows up, they should support, uh, I don't know how to say it, black people. I don't want to sound racist, sorry. But like, I want everyone to just peacefully coexist no matter how you grew up or how you look or how you, you know, I just wanted to say I'm very inspired, Thank even you. though I grew up in an amazing community. I just, I still want to help you. I still want to help everybody. So thank you, thank you for, thank you, so thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Jordan. I know that came from your heart and thank you. Yeah, yeah. And um, for me, you know, I be mean, speaking honestly, I'm not offended when someone calls me a black woman. I'm proud. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm a proud black okay. woman. <laughs> Okay, so I'm I'm I personally I'm not offended. Just to let you know. Okay. Yeah, I just want to say, um, hey, my name is Mike. I don't I didn't want to interrupt, but uh, I couldn't figure out how to raise my hand. I actually haven't raised a hand on Zoom. I just always listen. But um, I just wanted to say thank you for for uh, sharing, and um, and, and to build off of Jordan. Obviously, like I'm white, so. Like I didn't go through a lot of the problems and trials and tribulations of, of black people in the United States, African Americans, but like I have a lot of uh, black friends and you know a lot of my like they're my brothers. So like I'm a music artist myself. So I always try to like come to knowledge. So whenever I write music, I can incorporate it within my knowledge and like and we're working on like this uh Black History Month tape, but we're like we're not dropping it this month. We're gonna drop it in March just to represent like, you know, black history is not just confined to one month, like it's the whole year. So, you know, I definitely appreciate every everything that you had to offer. And, you know, I'm looking forward to all, all the rest of the ones that are coming too. Thank you, Ms. Malika, for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you for coming out. Professor, Professor Norm. Hey there. <laughs> all right, you actually, um, you know, I, I think all this is bringing back a, a lot for me. Uh, the young man that just spoke, when he finishes his, his work, make sure he takes his work and share it in, in, in the white community. I think, you know, sometimes we think that people need to come to us. We, we, we're good on our own. They, they need to go in their own community. But also, you know, Betty, when you were talking about Jim Crow and during that segregation period about how black folks were, were, were empowered, you know, we, we, we had our own banks, we, all, we had our own doctors, we had our own lawyers, we had our own, you know, all that. Then what killed it That's right. was, was integration. That's right. When integration hit, all of a sudden now going to a black doctor was not good, going to That's a right. black lawyer was a shyster. Right. Anything that That's was true. for us, we felt like if we had to spend our money someplace else. If we look at Black Wall Street, that was going on there. there. There was a lot of empowered people there. So what, what killed the Black community was basically integration. And um, and, and, and the, that, you know, that with, with the Jim Crow, they, they want our money, but they didn't want us. So uh, so I just wanted to kind of make that comment. You're absolutely right, Norman. Um, I remember even growing up in Rockville Center when I came back and on Banks Avenue, you could find a barbershop, you could find Mr. Jack's um, grocery store. <laughs> you, could, you could find what you needed. You could find the hairdresser, you could find it. All right, so um, integration had its part, but then again, this is just my own personal opinion. I think we lost a lot. As I was saying with the graduation, back in the day when you graduated from high school, 
the community would come out and you would walk down the street, no matter how many you were, and they would applaud you because they knew that you had done something that the past generation hadn't done. Mm -hmm. uh, what a lovely thing to, to do for somebody, to, because what it's saying is that I expect you to move forward. So uh, integration was positive in some ways, but as a culture, we lost a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think uh, having conversations like this also reminds us to get back to supporting, mm -hmm. supporting one another, and um, and on and appreciating our our culture. Yes, Professor Norm. Okay, what what would that look like when you say supporting you? Do? What, what what do you mean by that? And, and and how should we how should we take that? And what should we be doing? I'm glad you asked that. There are a lot of um, I would say there's a lot of black owned uh, businesses out there, and um, I think sometimes we need to actively look for the black owned businesses and support them. And the uh, um, just for people that don't understand um, in the black community, the um, uh, the dollar in the black community is not, is not, um, is not treasure, it's not circulated. We support other communities with our dollar, but we don't support our own. And in, in that we're, 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 uh, we're chipping away at our progress. So, I would encourage people to look for black owned businesses and support them because understand that the, um, the racism still exists. It's still very challenging to have a black owned business. So if you'd like to support, I would say to look for that. There's, um, you can find it online, you know, um, consider giving your business uh, to uh, doing your research and giving your business elsewhere and, and not looking over if you know if you're coming from the black community not looking over someone a black owned business because simply because they're black that used to be it used to be a, a thing of pride and now it's just like well let me let me see something else or if you go to someone a, a black owned business you think they're going to get a discount you know we, we need to support one another we need to appreciate one another in general we do it for everyone else we definitely need to do it for the community so, um, did I answer your question? And the community these days is different. It doesn't look the same. It's not in the same neighborhood. Look at us. We're spread out all over the place. So sometimes it's hard to go down the block and say, you know, it's easy to spend this money right down the block instead of looking online and getting somebody who might be in a neighboring community. But that's the reestablishment of community that we need to do. We need to understand it's, it's past boundaries now. We also have the tools to do it. This is what Zoom is about. This is why you're having this tonight. People are coming from everywhere without even leaving their home. And you can call up a business. I'm a black um, home business, and I have struggled for years. Mm -hmm. You know, I still do consulting. We still we, I went out a couple of weeks ago and got a couple of more, you know, good estimates. But it's hard to to reach out to people in communities that there is no community now. So um, one of the things we need to do. Uh, is get involved with each other um, through these type of multimedia platforms. And I think mm -hmm. this is a good start. Things like this is good because it, it brings up a conversation yeah. and it brings up um, a question like you asked. I yeah. was going to principal, principal Norman. So, uh, <laughs> but, but it is, it is a, it's a good question, but the answers are there. This is a start. These <laughs> connections. Yeah be made even easier now if we can just tap into some of the technology. Yeah, yeah we almost have to come up with a redefinition of how we view the black community. You know, when exactly. we times we're looking at the black community as geography, but now I think the black community has to be basically a mentality. In other words, you know, like you said, through mechanisms like this, you know, we, we need to find ways to to support each other and 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 let each other know that as they say in the old country, I got your back. But also remember, and, and Norman and I can attest to this, it was our generation who dropped the ball, if the truth be told. Because for the first time, we were finally allowed to go and live in other neighborhoods who didn't necessarily want us there, but they couldn't keep us. And, and a lot of times they did, 
but some, some of us got through. So once we were able to go to school, live in that community, many times we forgot about what, it, what our communities had done for us, okay? Mm -hmm. So I, in many ways, my generation dropped the ball because we were so, and, and for some of us, the trauma of living with some of the crazy stuff that we did was like, okay, I'm out. And then there were some of us that decided to stay, but uh, it was my, our generation who dropped the ball. And, and you know what, Betty, to go along with that, and how we also dropped the ball with that, we never talked about our struggles to, to, to the younger generations. Mm. So in other words, you know, after the civil rights movement that we were free, after the, the age of Obama, you know we're in a post race society, and we think that we have arrived, and we never really shared our struggles. No. You know, the thing that, that you were talking about, you know, these are the things that our kids say, hey, wait a minute. My mommy and daddy went through that, or my, my, my grandfather was, you know, went through that. And those things we didn't talk about. Instead, we were talking about what would be the successes, mm -hmm. what we need for tomorrow, instead of having the foundation of yesterday. Right. It's like in the mid 80s, everybody was going to become a business majors. Mm -hmm. We thought about education. Yep. You need to be, we need educators. Yep. We really do. We need educators. Who can, yeah, it's 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 a little different. One of the reasons why I was successful in Brentwood is because I knew a lot of the people. You get stupid with me. You want me to come to your house? Nah, Miss Green. Okay, we can settle this then. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh is someone so and so your grandma? How she know? I know. Yeah, yeah that sense of community. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Were there any other questions or comments? This was um, I yes. want to comment. Hi. Um, Hi, I'm Kendra. Um, hey. I live in Gordon Heights, and I just love hearing this conversation right now, hearing elders speak, because um, I feel like I kind of haven't heard this type of conversation in a long time. Um, I grew up with my grandma, and she told me my history as soon as I came out the womb. Um, so I knew a lot. I knew what I knew who I am. As soon as I started to talk, I knew who I was. I know who I am, but but the thing is, as uh, Ms. Green says, she feels like her generation dropped the ball. Um, I don't want you to feel like that, but at the same time, I do feel like if we would have had a stronger bridge um, of elders for us, I feel like we will have that same sense of community now. And like Mr. Norman said earlier as well, we have a new sense of community now. Now there's gonna be a different infrastructure because my community is all black. And I remember growing up, we had a federal credit union. And yeah. so all black people banked it. Everybody banked it in this community. Now it's not there anymore. So we don't have the same skill set or the sustainability to keep things going. Like and I just feel like our young generation, we need to have those skills or at least have the motivation to know, mm -hmm. okay, let's build, but how are we going to build in this new way of building? So I just want to comment and say thank you. Thank and you. I appreciate you all. Thank you. Very good. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, you know, can I make one last statement that I promise you I will be quiet? <laughs> you know, when we, we talk about our, our elders and I always see how things have changed. When, when I was a kid growing up, and then we were hanging out on the corner and we saw Miss Mary walking down the street. We would cross the street because Miss Mary was coming. And why were we running from Miss Mary to the elder? Because she had she had words of wisdom to, to, to tell us, but she also had work for us to do that she wasn't going to pay us. So we, we used to run from Miss Mary. Now we go to the 21st century. Miss Mary is walking, is coming down the street. She sees the young people. She, she crossed the street. She crossed it. Now, why she crossed the street is because she knew that she had to worry about her for her life. So we have to rebuild, you know, that yeah. bridge that, that, that because it's our foundation is, is, is with our elders. And, and, and with that, our youth will keep things going. So it's, so it's, it's really something that we really need to, to consider and, and do. Thank you. Thank you. Um, with that, I, I, I can't. I can't express, um, express my appreciation enough, Miss Betty. You, you've done an amazing job. You kicked welcome. off this series with the spirit that we needed. Thank you. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you for asking me. I'm going to go finish up your pie. There you go. My daughter will bring it to work tomorrow for you. 
Hey, now. <laughs> okay. As long as my husband doesn't eat it. No, uh, Kalia. <laughs> Um, I um, want to also encourage you all to tune in the same information next Thursday at 6 p.m. We're going to hear about um, social activism and the importance um, okay. of social activism and the importance of younger people getting involved. When they think of social activism, they think of, they think of oh, that's someone else's job, not realizing that the civil rights movement was it was built with the college students. You know, they were high school students marching. The elementary school kids. So, so we, we, we need to get back to that. We need to understand that. And um, that's the next one. So we have three more after tonight. Miss Betty, you did an amazing job with this kickoff. Oh, thank you. Oh, yes. Yes, yes, thank yes. You. I already had texts coming saying that we need to have her back. So well, thank I'll, you. Yes. <laughs> thank you, thank, you, thank you. Take some time to complete that survey. You'll get your mask. Hashtag good trouble. Well, can I get a mask? <laughs> oh, Miss Betty. Yes, absolutely. That's the least I can do. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Enjoy your night. <laughs> On the soul train line, for you. Ah, slide. Let's do an electric slide. Let me find out. <laughs> okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for staying. I know that was, it, it, it went a little longer than an hour, but it just kept going. Thank you. Thank you, Christy, for staying to the end and recording.